Next talk is going to be by Gabriel Becker, who will be speaking to us about R tables, leveraging data visualization concepts to declare and create clinical trial tables. And I think they will be speaking live. I see you're here yep. and unmuted. I so am, yep. I am go here. ahead and share your slides and get started. Yep. Just... Uh, is that, do you see the schedule or do you see my slides? I see your slides. Great. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is going to be a pretty different talk from the, from the last one. The last one is very interesting, um, but sort of covering a pretty different uh, scope than we're going to talk about here. Um, so just some basic background around about me. So I'm a statistical computing consultant. I've been working with um an organization called nest within roche uh, for a number of years now developing the r tables software which provides a general table generation uh framework which they are using to generate the um the tables that are going going to be going into the clinical trials uh clinical trial reporting um yeah, I have my email there if you want to get in contact with me. Um, and I'm also on GitHub. Uh, so tables are very uh, important. And, you know, they're useful for EDA, but they're also a crucial aspect of the reporting process. Um, and now you're probably wondering, you know, what's why I'm talking about tables with a with a picture on the screen. So let me just go through some things here. Um, what ends up being the case is that we can understand tables and how we should think about them and how we should create them by thinking about things that aren't tables. Um, this may be a little bit counterintuitive, but it ends up being really powerful. And I'm going to try to showcase a few of the ways that it's uh, that that it helps us uh, today. Uh, this is a multi-year project uh, project, a very sophisticated and complex piece of software. So I'm not going to be able to cover everything, but I should be able to sort of hopefully convince you that you know there are benefits to thinking about tables in a way that's pretty fundamentally different from the way that most people uh, typically think about them, I think. So the basic foundation of this is tables are faceted data visualizations. They are. Um, and so we can see here, these. this is the same information um, represented side by side in a faceted bar plot uh and a sort of complex structured table and so we can see each element of the table corresponds to exactly one element or one aspect of the um of the plot and vice versa right so we have the concept of rows in tables and we can sort of we can look at what the concept of row would mean in this faceted data visualization. Now it's notable that a row is not, you know, a set of these subplots. It's actually a slice across these subplots. Uh, and then we have, you know, a single subplot here, and that corresponds to what, what we generally call a sort of vertical section um, within the table. And then we've got the columns here. We've got the faceting, uh, the faceting information, which is recreated in the table here. And then we have the individual cell element in the table, which corresponds to an individual bar, a single bar within this bar plot, um, which again is not a full subplot. It's an element within a subplot. Now this this bar has a width zero because the count was zero here, but the the point stands. This is also an at analog to a single cell right here. So tables are faceted data visualizations. They are plots. And it's useful to think about them as plots. 
Now, what do I not mean when I say that? I do not mean tables have a similar purpose to faceted data visualizations. That's true, but that's not what I'm saying here. I do not mean that faceted data visualizations are similar to tables. That is also true, and it's also not what I'm talking about here. I do not mean that we should be rendering our tables in ggplot2. That would be very silly, and we're not going to do it. And finally, I do not mean that technically everything's made out of pixels which have an X position and a Y position, and therefore they are data visualizations. That's not what we're talking about, even though it's technically true. So what do we need in order to describe a faceted plot that we would like to make? We don't need very many things. We need a fastening structure in the row or Y dimension. We need a fastening structure in the column or X dimension. And then we need information about what will be drawn in each subplot. And in the ggplot2 framework, that's going to be your geomes and your stats, the combination of the stats and the geomes, right? Um, and then there's some various other miscellaneous metadata annotations like titles and axis ticks and things like that. And those do have analogs in in the table space for the most part but we're not really gonna some of them do like ticks not so much but access labels do but we're not really gonna talk a ton about those in this talk here um but here we can just see i didn't i, I didn't draw the plot but this is pretty basic ggplot code uh that is probably familiar to to many of the people in the audience here um and here we have the geome bar that's going to be number three, which is our, you know, what's drawn in each subplot. Uh, and then we have the um, facet grid, which is going to define both one and two. So both the faceting structure in the Y dimension and the faceting structure in the X dimension, which are the rows and columns respectively. Okay, so that's what we need to describe a faceted plot. So what then do we need to describe a faceted uh, or a table? It's the same because as we just talked about, tables are faceted plots. So what do we need? We need the fastening structure in the row dimension and the fastening structure in the column dimension and what's going to be drawn in each of the panes, each of the subplots. That's it. That's all we need to define our table. So our tables defines a framework of verbs. We call them layouting verbs uh, for reasons that I may have time to get into at the end. Um, but we have these verbs and they allow you to declare the various aspects that we just talked about. So that's it. This is the list of things that you need to define any table other than like the actual logic for calculating the cell values, which you know you're up to it's up to you to to implement but in terms of declaring table structure this is it this it's it's a very sort of like deep higher like situation where you have a, a number a relatively small number of low level verbs and you can combine them to do sort of arbitrarily complex things um so faceting we have these split functions so we split rows by and split columns by and so we unlike facet grid we incrementally declare faceting and whenever we declare faceting by default that's going to happen inside whatever faceting already existed uh in that image we're going to see an example of that um which will, i think make it a little more clear um let me it looks like there's a lot of stuff going on in the chat let me just look at that quickly uh Okay, so the, thanks for the feedback. It doesn't look like there's any questions there, though. So um, if you do have questions, please do ask in the chat. I will try to keep an eye on it. Um, but yeah, so that's for declaring fasting. That's all. That's all we need. Um, and then cell value derivation. This is the equivalent to the stat plus geome situation where you're defining the calculations that are going to generate the values that appear in the cells of your table. We call that cell value derivation because those are what those words mean. Um, and so we have just two 
just two of these. Um, and then we have summary situation, which is equivalent to marginal or group summaries uh, in a plot, which weren't actually in the sort of Titanic data set plot that I showed you earlier, but they could have been. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as things move forward. But that's it. That's all there is. So now let's go through some examples. Column fastening in ggplot. We've got our facet grid calls equals arm. And in our tables, split columns by arm. And there you go. Side by side, everything is nice. We can also see just as a just as a brief aside here, um, the range is multi-valued. So whoops. Sorry, getting ahead of myself there. Uh, range is multi-valued here. So we can have multiple values in a cell um, if we want to. We can also, as we'll see, I think we'll see later, have multiple um, cells within a facet akin to having those multiple um, bars in a single subplot in the bar chart. Um, so row faceting. Not really very much different than what we were doing a second ago, um, but now everything's taller. So we do row equals far as sex in the ggplot side, and then we do split rows by sex, um, which is the the cdisc um, cdisc specified variable name uh, for that, which is why we're using it here. Um, and there you go. We've got uh, we've got a nice tall table and plot here. Uh, so XADSL is a synthetic ADSL data set that is ships with our tables. Um, it was generated by another open source tool called Random CDISC Data, uh, which also came out of the the Nest project. Um, but yeah, it's it's correct. It's the data, um, and it. It um, that particular data set is included with actually it's it's included with formatters, which is a dependency of our tables. So whenever you have our tables, you will you will have this data set. Um, so grid faceting, we can have faceting and columns and rows at the same time. Obviously, we know that uh, ggplot can do this mostly because even if you didn't know before today, you saw it earlier in the Titanic plot that it was doing that. Um, and here we can see that we can also have that in our tables. You just do split columns by, and then you do split rows by. Um, and if anyone isn't familiar, this um, sort of vertical line greater than thing, um, is um is the native pipe so you can just think of that as the same as the greater pipe for the purposes here um it there are a few differences but they're not important um so um yeah no, thanks pavel he uh pavel is the um technical lead of the larger project of which our tables is one of the one of the packages so um so that's that we can also nest faceting structure i don't have the code here um because i thought the tree was a little bit more uh useful but in both um ggplot and our tables we can nest faceting so we can split and by arm and then for each arm we can split by gender via the via the sex variable right um so you can see that on the left and on the right here for for the plot and the table respectively um and let me just look at what time it is okay um and yeah so that's that so I've just talked about how our tables is basically going to be leveraging the fact that tables, 
specifically the type of complex structured tables that are involved in clinical trial analysis or EDA of data are faceted data visualizations. Um, and now we're going to talk about some generalizations to how certain aspects of visualization work typically that we can that sort of arise from applying them to tables. So first is what faceting does. Typically and traditionally, faceting is a partition of the data, which means it is both mutually, the, the sets, the different facets are both mutually exclusive and exhaustive, uh, potentially with the exception of the of removal of NAs. Um, and so you're going to take a categorical variable, you look at the values of the variable, variable, and that will define your subsets. So this is the sort of group by in dplyr type of thing. That's fine. Our tables is happy to do that, but it doesn't have to be. Our tables has the our tables doesn't care whether things are mutually exclusive or whether they're exhaustive. So what this allows you to do is it allows you to very easily, as we see on the right here, have facets that overlap each other. And in the table space, this is actually pretty common. It's very common to have a all patients category, for example, but just that you can also, as we see here, combine arms to have sort of virtual combined arms for, for certain and analytical purposes and things like that. And our tables is happy to do that. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, so faceting has been sort of generalized beyond what people typically think of when they when they're talking about faceting. Um, yeah, exactly. Placebo versus everything else uh, would be another example of this. Um, next, we have subplots and what's sort of what's happening in the subplots. I, it's not I, I drew a table on the left here, uh, it was, uh, but um, in ggplot, typically, unless you sort of really want to go through a fair bit of pain, um, the subplots are all going to look the same. They're going to be plotted on different data, which is associated with the facet panes of your faceting that you've declared. But they're all going to be bar charts, for example, in the example that I had before. Or they're all going to be um, you know, scatter plots with different stuff in them, right? Um, but our table doesn't care if you have the same stuff in the facets or not. Um, so here we have, we're splitting by sex. So the facets are male and female, female and male, right? And then within that, those facets, we have, you know, various things, right? We have a mean and a range, right? So that's the equivalent of like a bar and a, you know, line, a scatter plot line or something like that. Um, and you can also, I don't show this here, but you can also have columns that have fundamentally different meanings within the R tables framework, which is another thing that you would not see in a sort of faceted plot. Like you can have a column where the full first column is N and the second column is a confidence interval from a model that you have fit. And the third column, you know, is the p-value of, you know, that confidence interval, including zero, you know, et cetera, right? Um, so I will, yeah, so I'm gonna, uh, I've got about one minute. I'll try to address your question, Eric, but I do want to get through a couple of things first. Um, the last thing is marginal summaries. Uh, these are not really possible in sort of base ggplot2, but there are extensions to ggplot2, one of which is the ggside function. Um, where you can do that. Uh, we also have that in uh, our tables where you can, with, there's a native verb that we saw in the list called summarize row groups, which generates, um, which generates sort of marginal group summaries and puts them in your table. And the, by default, that means count and then percentage of the count in the, in the column. Um, something that you can't really do in plots is have multiple different levels of 
information being marginally summarized, but you can in tables very easily. Um, so you can see here, we're, mar we're marginally summarizing both the genders and within each gender we're marginalizing the strata one, which is like a made up variable. It doesn't really mean anything, but um, yeah. So um, with that, I'm going to very briefly, uh, this might actually answer your, uh, your question, Eric, um, but there, a lot of people don't know this, but the Nest team um, has released what is called the TLG catalog, which is an open source compendium for code for TLG generation. Um, it is open source with a commercially permissive license. It's publicly available now. And it is also the code that is used internally at Roche to generate these tables during clinical trial analysis starting um, this year. Um, it's based on TURN and our tables. I don't have time to talk about TURN. It is another open source package. It's currently on GitHub. It will be coming to CRAN soon. And um, Pavel put a clickable link in the chat there so people can go look at that. Um, this has 225 table variants um, with code that's just there that you can use. That's, you know, there's it uses synthetic data, obviously, in the in the actual catalog, but the code, you can use any any data set that, that meets the spec, right? Um, there are 88 sort of top level table named tables, and then each of them has a number of variants. Um, this is the these are the numbers, right? So there's 68 different variants for adverse events tables, which seemed like a lot to me, but you know, I'm not a biostatistician. Um and then the very last thing, I know I'm, I'm, I'm very short on time, uh, but another sort of larger project of which our tables is a part. Oh, and the other thing, so the TLG catalog, the, the sort of analytics are done by this package called Turn, but all the tables themselves are generated using the core R tables framework, which is why I'm mentioning it here. Um, and then, uh, I'm also part of a working group for our tables for regulatory submission from the R consortium. Um, and we have authored a book um, and it's available now for sort of, you can look at the, at the repo, uh, which I have a link there. Um, I know you guys can't click on my slides, but that's the, that's the URL. Um, and then it is, it is slated to be published as an official first edition on the 23rd of this month. So that uh, book covers six different table engine packages of which our tables is one. And then it has worked examples for sort of five archetypal reporting tables from clinical trial analysis done in all six packages so that you can compare and contrast. Um, and with that, I think I'm maybe a little bit over time, but hopefully not too much. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone for um for listening hopefully uh that was helpful um and informative um and i don't know if i have time for questions or not that's up to the moderator i think we'll save any questions for the chat that was a really fantastic um presentation of our tables thank you so much um it looks like there's a lot of great stuff there and um please um answer any remaining questions in the chat and if there's any relevant links you want to drop for us there that would be great and thanks so much sounds great thank you thanks all everyone right. all right and with that we'll move on to our last speaker of this little block um 